This is Twit. All right, we are back from the break, and that means it's time for me to stare at the sun until it burns away my eyes. No, no, no. I actually bring on somebody who's going to help me not do that. It's Rod Pyle, Spaceman. Hello, Rod. What? What? No Space Force theme? How, how, how are you doing? <laughs> I'm doing well. I am one of these days going to convince someone to let that have a reverb on the end of it because it just... Spaceman, <laughs> which just sounds so cool. Um, how like are it. you, friend? I'm okay. I'm uh, actually getting ready tomorrow, midday, to head off to Austin, Texas, from which I will drive west to hopefully, if the traffic isn't overwhelming and the clouds don't roll in, see the totality of the eclipse. Wow. Okay. So, yes, yeah. we are here to talk about the eclipse. And here's the thing that I like to do I like to make sure that everyone who listens to the show, who may have different levels of interest in, understanding of, and whatever else might be involved uh, of the science behind an eclipse, that everybody gets a little something out of this. So I want to start with a something that many of us may have learned in, you know, perhaps elementary or middle school. Tell us about what a solar eclipse is and what a lunar eclipses and what we can expect uh, from the upcoming eclipse. Which one is it and what does it mean? Okay, so lunar eclipse is more common. It's seen across a much wider wider region and it is a lot less exciting. So <laughs> in a lunar eclipse, the sun, uh, the earth moves between the sun and the moon and the moon is covered by the earth's shadow, so it goes from being the usual white moon we're used to seeing to being kind of a ruddy brownish red, and then getting a dark gray. It never goes completely black because the sun's light kind of gets warped around the earth by the atmosphere, so you still have this kind of light gray surface. And it's interesting, but it's kind of anticlimactic, really. It takes hours. And uh, totality for that can range, I, I don't remember, I think an hour, 15 minutes or something like that. But they're still very cool. A solar eclipse is much rarer, and that's when the moon passes between the Earth and the sun. And because the moon's orbit is inclined in relation to that of the Earth and the sun, it doesn't happen very often. Everything's got to line up just right. What blows my mind about it being kind of a moderately lifelong atheist is the fact that somehow our moon is exactly, <laughs> exactly the right size, you know, within a matter of a quarter mile or something to block out the sun ever. Hmm. I mean, that's not something if you're on Mars and the, and one of its moons gets to you in the sun, you just see something looks like a lumpy potato <laughs> transiting along. So, so this is pretty, pretty amazing. So this eclipse, um, and by the way, eclipses are like some other activities in life where it's it's a binary thing. It's either is or it isn't. So if you're not within the shadow itself, you just see the sun getting dimmer. Got it. And that's it. You got to be within that shadow. And it's uh, how wide is it this time? I, I, I maybe twenty miles or something. If you're just a mile the wrong direction, you're not going to see a total eclipse. Mm. You know. So it's 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 really a, a very critical thing, which is why, of course, so many of us are going to be heading off to Texas. So in your area up in the Bay, it'll start about 1015 on Monday morning. Uh, maximum shadows about 1130. It ends about 1220. Unfortunately, from there, you're only going to see about 35 percent of the sun being covered. Wow. That's so not very probably, much at all. It, it's not. It's about a third, and you know, you may notice it get a little dimmer, but it, it's it's not it's it's not a jaw dropping experience by any means. So, I, I just want to make sure I get to the important part before we run out of time, which is how to watch this because yes. the last eclipse, so many people had problems because they jumped on Amazon or Walmart dot com or one of these marketplaces and bought glasses that were usually made in China. Most of them are. And some of them were okay, and some of them weren't okay. Uh -huh. And some people got retinal damage. And I can tell you, because when I was a kid, I had a small telescope, and I had a little solar filter that you could screw into the bottom of the eyepiece. It was just basically a piece of welding glass. And no parental supervision with this thing. So I <laughs> stared at the sun for a long time, because it was cool. You saw sunspots and all that. And I had 
severe cataracts by the time I was in my late forties wow. because of that. I mean, to the point that I went into the, to the surgeon's office and he's, you know, he, you know how they look in your eye, mm-hmm. little thing. He's like, hmm, 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 fussing around. He says, Hey Kelly, get the whole staff in no here. No way. They do this, you were like, one of those. Parade, <gasps> just, we've never seen it this bad on somebody as young as you. And I said, gee, oh. thanks. Actually, I think that was the last time somebody called me young, too. <laughs> anyway, so I had surgery in my early 50s and all is well, but it's not something you want. So the way to avoid that is to make sure you get good eclipse glasses. Now, mm-hmm. it's getting pretty late in the day to order from Amazon. The two companies I would trust right up front are called Lunt, L-U-N-T, and uh, Celestron, who most people have heard of. But I don't think you'll get them in time. Mm-hmm. So I'm told they're selling them at Walmart and Target. Uh, Warby Parker, yeah, I heard giving about them Warby away, Parker, yeah. I think, and most county libraries and some city libraries. Now, of course, you're trusting them to know what to get, right? right? So you want, if you see NASA approved on them, that doesn't mean anything because NASA is not in the business of approving sunglasses. If it says American Astronomical Society approved and ISO compliant, they're probably okay. But there are some forgeries that still have that printed. So the best thing to do, we're told by our good friend Tarek Malik, is to grab those things, take them to the brightest point source of light in your house you can, and make sure you don't see it. Ah, that's Because nothing in your house is going to be as bright as the sun. Right. Welding glasses don't work. Stacking sunglasses doesn't work. The two coolest things I remember doing... If you can get to a local planetarium, you know, they'll, if they're open, they'll have telescopes set up on the lawn doing projection systems and stuff. And that works great. But honestly, if you go find a, a tree with moderately sized leaves, that leaf canopy acts like a whole bunch of pinholes. You can do the same thing with a salad colander, actually. Hmm. Just hold it out and you'll see a hundred little eclipsed suns wow. all over the ground. It's the wildest thing. And it never occurred to me before I, I saw this happen during a partial eclipse that when you're walking past a tree and you see all those little dappled circles kind of moving around the sidewalk, mm-hmm. those are little projections of the sun because the tree is acting like this big pinhole source. Huh. So either do that or you can, of course, create a pinhole, a little piece of cardboard and hold a piece of paper below it and project it. Or you know, barring anything else, if you've completely forgotten, you can make a fist and hold it you know, over a piece of shaded sidewalk or something and project it that way. But do not look directly at the sun as you discussed, because that's, that's bad for your face. Yeah. Can, and I want to, I want to talk about that for a second, because sure. if I start to look even anywhere near close to the sun, my eyes yeah. start to hurt, right? I, it, yeah. it actually physically hurts. And so I know to look away from this light source. How, why is it that people does it not hurt when there's a moon in the way and so it's just doing damage without you realizing it Mm. is is that what happens or is there still damage and people are just like i don't care i have to keep looking i want to see it eclipse what's (laughs) going on there that people or am i weird and other people don't experience pain when a bright light is shining in their eyes so when you're if you're in the path of totality which Mm -hmm. is that shadow um, and in this case, it's going to last about four minutes and 20 seconds, I think, right up till the last moment when they completely overlap and align perfectly, you'll see bright what they call Bailey's beads or diamonds around the perimeter, and it's still too bright to look at. And thank God, you know, our monkey brain is smart enough to say, hey, stupid, don't look at the sun, it's bad for you, right? Um, so you you can't, you know, you just end up looking away. But once it's in totality, all you're seeing is the corona or this this big uh, atmosphere of gas that's around the sun that's bright, but it's not the star itself. So you see, a really, it's fascinating. It's like there's a hole punched in the sky. So the, the one I saw back in 2017 in Oregon, this, the sky gets kind of a, a silvery brown pearlescent. Ooh. And then there's this hole punched in the sky with this kind of bright yellowish red perimeter around it. So at that point, once the bright part of the sun is blocked, it's okay to look at it. But the second you start seeing those little bright beads appearing on the other side as the shadow begins to move away, because obviously the moon's moving in our orbit, then you have to, 
you have to put your eclipse glasses back on. And it's a hard moment God because is. it's such a magical, compelling experience. As it starts to leave, you're still sort of amazed at, at this, this wonder of nature and seeing these little little white spots begin to appear, but then it's over and you're going, oh. Oh, oh man. Can you imagine yeah. before we had any understanding of what was going mm -hmm. on, how many people probably ended up with horrible damage to their eyes you know, ages and ages ago and didn't realize where it came from it, and just right. suddenly they couldn't see anymore. And it was because this horrible thing happened where the sun went away and I have no reason to understand why that's happening. It must be by God punishing me. And then suddenly, like 40 years later, you have this curse of not being able to see anymore. And it's all because they didn't know they weren't supposed to look at the sun. And apparently some people still don't know that they're not supposed to look at the sun. Well, and, and <sighs> some people get bad advice or, yeah. you know, by inadequate optics for it and end up hurting their eyes. Yeah, it had to have been really, I mean, there were people that would throw themselves down wells and of course, you know, they'd sacrifice small animals and God knows what else. It had to be pretty scary, mm -hmm. like you say, because, you know, suddenly this thing you count on all the time to be there just disappears. And it'd be like today for us, if suddenly you're looking at the moon and it just winks off. Or if you saw a three body problem, did I have you not, three yet. Body problem? not yet. Okay. It's on my list. So I tried to read the book. And as I think Leo mentioned on one of the weekend shows, the translation just was kind of flat. But yeah. seeing the show, which was a you know co-production in China and here in the US, um, it, the stars just wink off one day. Oof. That's so and scary. People are like, wait, that's not supposed to happen. <laughs> so <laughs> well, this is kind of the modern equivalent of a, of the of seeing eclipses when you didn't know what they were. Yeah, it's just like... But yeah, uh, I mean, you really want to stare at it. And, and you can imagine, you know, say you're in an area, you're just off the center line, so it's like 97% covered. So it's markably dimmer. It's getting gray. Things are looking weird and creepy around you, and you want to look up and see what's going on, yeah, but you still can't. Because even at that, you're just going to roast the heck out of your retinas. So it'll enter the U.S., through southwest Texas, go through uh, the central states leading northeast from there and end up exiting through Vermont, New York State, New Hampshire, and then exit North America through Newfoundland. So you got to be somewhere along that path to see the total eclipse. Total eclipse of the heart. Um, it's <laughs> I didn't prepare you for this, so you will be forgiven if you don't have the, okay. the quick answer. The, I just you you mentioned that this is that solar eclipses are rarer, and uh, you mentioned though 2017 was the last time that you saw one, which mm -hmm. is rare but not super rare. What's the rarest astronomical occurrence that people like regularly know about? regularly know about well it's going to say the rarest thing i know of is a supernova okay and we keep waiting for one of those um they happen every now and then but they're telescopic events but something like the crab nebula nebula back in i don't know 1420 or whatever it was was something people actually could see with the naked eye and that's just a star kind of going into a phase where it starts eating itself and suddenly getting very bright for a while um hmm, what is the rarest because our our meteor or not meteor showers, but um, comet are comets rarer than uh, eclipses? Or? I guess probably a good comet is. You know, <laughs> there's a lot of comets that come around uh, in 1984 when you you were personally but a theory. Yes, <laughs> um, Halley's comet uh, came back around. And so I took a group of people from Griffith Observatory. We went down to the border of Guatemala to this horrible little town in South Mexico. It was They had tried to make it a resort town and oh. failed. So we were kind of oh, there to so fail sad. remnants of that. But we had a great view to the south. Mm -hmm. And it was supposed to be spectacular. The problem with comets is, although we have a, you can calculate a general idea of their track around the sun. You just don't know how the comet and the sun are going to interact exactly. Uh, so we know, you know, the reason comets form tails is because they're made of ice and gas. And as that ice uh, sublimes or evaporates and, and it is streaming behind the thing, the sun lights it up. 
Um, but you're never quite sure exactly how much ice it's going to hit and, and how much you're going to see. So this was a real non-event. I mean, it looked like a Q-tip held at arm's length, <laughs> which was not what we expected. That's we so expected frustrating. This horizon to horizon thing, right? Um, so good comets are, are really rare. There was one in 2021, I think it was during the pandemic, that was green. Ooh. That was pretty cool. But again, here's the problem, though, you know, and, and again, this is something because of your age, you probably, you may, may not have experienced uh -huh. it. When I was a kid, you could drive two hours out of the city and it was dark. Oh, it was see. really, yeah. really dark. Now I drive out of LA and I go East. And by the time it starts to get dark from LA, I'm seeing the lights from Phoenix. Mm -hmm. By the time it starts getting dark driving North, I'm seeing the lights of Las Vegas because these cities are so overlit. So really to get dark, you've got to go somewhere really remote and rural. And that's when you see these amazing things in the sky. By the way, you sort of mentioned meteor showers. They're pretty common. Mm -hmm. Oh, I've got it. Oh. Here's the rare one. Okay. Uh, oh, I've got it. Oh, thank you. That was a great question. Um, in 1960, so, so meteor showers happen when we pass through the tail of a defunct comet. Okay. Right? So in the Earth's orbit, are these kind of trails, that they're, they're just long trails of gravel, basically, and the Earth passes through them at different times of the year. So they repeat year to year. So we have the Perseids in the summer and the Orionids in the winter. And if you go to a dark area, you can see maybe one every few seconds, every two or three seconds. There's little, most of them, little, you can easily miss them. There are some big ones. In 1966, I think it's in April, there's a shower called the Leonids, and about every 30 years, it can do something kind of wild. So I was uh, 10 years old, and I was spending a, a, a late fall evening out, or spring evening out in our backyard in Pasadena, California, where it was still darker than it is now anyway. And suddenly the sky just opened up, and it was like God was dumping a salt shaker. I mean, there were thousands of them wow. happening. And I was terrified. So I'm I sure. ran in and woke up my parents and said, the sky's falling. And they said, that's nice, honey. Go back to sleep. <laughs> so I ran outside. And I think it was one in the morning because after midnight, the earth is just turning. It turns into the shower and it becomes more aggressive. And we haven't had something like that since. So that was one of those once in a lifetime things. So that's pretty darn rare because I'm old, right? I'm, I'm Leo's age within a month. And I've only seen it once. So, yeah. That's pretty rare. Oh, man. I wonder when the next big one is going to be. Well, the problem is, you, you know, they can predict, well, this, you know, it's the Leonids and it's been 32 and a half years. So maybe this year it'll be really good. But the last time was not anything like what I saw. So, yeah, it'll be a while. You'll see it. Hopefully. Yeah. I'll be sure to pay it because I'll be honest with you. I, I just look at people's photos of some of these that are more regular occurrences. Yeah. They don't yeah. really, but. Now the Leonids, I'm going to have to, I'm going to be paying more attention to, because that seems like a really cool thing to see. Uh, well, but you're, so I'm going to open a lit place, one. right? I, I was thinking about, um, uh, Bodega Bay. Uh, I've been out there mm -hmm. late at night and it's still, it's still, you know, being lit by nearby cities, but not as much as a lot of the stuff in the area. And it does remind me of being back home in Missouri where out at my grandparents' house in the country, it was you so have seen dark, dark skies. Yeah. And it was amazing. <sighs> it's amazing to see truly dark skies, especially uh because we also had fireflies around. And so you just have these stars literally surrounding. I've never you seen it. Other than Pirates of the Caribbean at Disneyland, I've never seen a firefly. Oh, those are fake. Oh, um, wow. Yeah. So that's, that's one of those those life experiences I haven't gotten yet. I, You know, for you, I would think heading northeast. Okay. Because you get out of the Bay Area and it gets pretty dark, but you'd have to go well east of the five, I would think. And then, of course, you're fighting trees. But if you can get some altitude, too, that, that doesn't hurt. Northeast. Okay. Well, yeah. I will have to like way scope out, yeah, scope out a location to really pick up on it. Well, so let me just say, if you hop on space.com ever, you, you'll be apprised of these things because Tarek's very good about making sure he's, he's such an, uh, an astronomical uh, geek. It's great. And he makes sure they run really complete stories on these things. So you'll know well in advance when the next big meteor shower is going to be, you'll know advance when the next uh, eclipse will be. And they always give you viewing tips. And there's a site called, I think it's Dark Skies. Um, if you type Dark Skies to Google, you'll find it. Mm -hmm. There's a, there's a nonprofit group whose sole reason for being is to tell people where dark skies are. Oh, near nice. Them. <laughs> and there aren't, there aren't a lot. 
and uh, at least in this part of the woods. And so then you can, uh, you know, make a good plan of where to go and what to do. If you can get offshore, that's probably the best thing because you get a few miles offshore and it gets really dark. Nice. Oh, well, I will uh, definitely check that out. And so should all of our listeners. Rod Pyle, yeah. thank you so much for your time today. Thank you. Uh, of course, folks can head, well, they can uh, head over to twit.tv to check out This Week in Space. Uh, but where are Please. some other places folks should go to keep up with what you're doing? Well, I have an increasingly creaky website called pilebooks.com that I haven't updated in a while, but but all the good stuff is there. And uh, NSS.org is the website for the National Space Society. And although my name is not most of that stuff, I'm I'm the wizard behind the curtain pulling the levers <laughs> for the website. So it's a, as good a place as any. Awesome. Well, thank you, Rod Pyle, for uh, giving us plenty of information to make sure we stay safe for the uh, eclipse. I hope you enjoy your viewing experience, your safe viewing experience. And we'll see you again <laughs> soon. Thank you. Take care, buddy. Thanks so much for watching this little chunk of Tech News Weekly. If you'd like to get the full episode, well, head over to twit.tv slash TNW. There you'll find buttons you can click or tap to subscribe to the entire show in audio and video formats. Or just look in the description. We've got links down there as well. 